my long-time role model has been Larry Page. And the reason why is because Larry has built a company called Google, which I believe has had an impact unparalleled compared to any other company in the human history. And by that, I don't mean Google's market cap or the business that they have, they have done. I'm sure Google is a great business. What I really mean is Google's impact on human progress, Google's impact on our society. What Google has done is it has given every single individual access to the information that they need on one click. And what this means is it makes every single individual more productive. It allows every single individual to make better decisions in their life. It makes the whole world more productive. So in a simple sentence, what Google has done is it has significantly changed the pace of human progress over the last 15, 20 years. So when I was looking for where to go for my master's, one of my top choices was Stanford. And the reason for that was because Stanford was the birthplace for many of the companies that I admired, including Google. So when I went to Stanford, I was looking at which group should I be part of. And I looked at this group called Stanford HCI Group, where Terry Binograd was a professor. And the reason why I'm mentioning Terry Binograd is because he was also advisor of Larry Page. I wanted to work with Terry, but he was kind of semi-retired, so he was not taking any new students. I still became part of the group and was looking for an opportunity to work with him. And I did get that opportunity. Terry was starting a class called Designing Liberation Technology. And this class was very interesting because the goal of this class was not to like take a course and give an exam. The goal of this class is to look in the world where there is no access to information or the things that people need and see how technology can help access to those information and what would be its impact. We should study this, this impact in the real world and in real life. So as part of this course, I went to this place called Kibera, which is near Nairobi in Kenya. And it's one of the largest slums in, in the world. So when I went there, what I saw was poverty, no electricity, no internet. However, people had phones. They could do the basic calling. They could do text message. And there were a bunch of NGOs who were trying to do different, different things. So one of the big problems that everyone was trying to solve there was educating on sexually transmitted diseases. But one of the big problems that all these NGOs were facing was like they would put these office hours and classes and people would come but nobody wanted to like ask questions because there was social stigma attached with some of these topics. And they were struggling to really like educate people on some of the things that were very, very critical. Uh, I felt this problem was worthwhile as a project for this class. So I moved to Kibera, Nairobi, Kenya. And we worked on this technology which is basically built over a text message and the idea is just think of this as anonymous Slack channel. So you have Slack, where each NGO can put a Slack channel on the topics that they were interested in. And you can basically post these messages on that channel. People can follow those channels. So anyone who is following, you can broadcast your post. But one of the most important aspects of that was you can ask questions anonymously. So you can just simply say, here is a, post, here is a question to this post, but it will not tell you who is asking that question. And then somebody can sort of, sort of like respond by saying, here is the answer to this post ID, without knowing who the, who the question asking person was. What they fundamentally changed was, it basically like brought this new engagement in conversation that they were looking for. And of course, you know, people were asking questions and they were getting access to these things instantly, and they started using this for like job posting and other things. So for the first hand, I could see in unimaginable way how access to information can change lives. So this was around 2011, when I was also writing my statement of purpose for my PhD program. And I was looking at like, what should really be my statement of purpose? What problem do I want to spend my time on? The problem that if you're able to solve meaningfully, can help the world be a better place, can increase the productivity of the whole world. So I was looking at like some inspiration, and of course one inspiration was Google's mission statement. And Google's mission statement is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible, but most importantly, in one click. So instant access to information is a major part. And Google had done a pretty good job. Google basically organized all of the information on the internet, which you can access instantly. 
But the same problem went unsolved for all of the data that lives inside every organization. There is no Google equivalent inside each organization where we can ask questions or organizations can ask questions about all the data that they have. And that is a problem. Like every organization makes decisions on that data every single day, and those decisions that impact us. For example, government. They make decisions on a bunch of data that they have. Health or healthcare providers or hospitals, they make a ton of decisions on the data that they have. All the banks, all the insurance companies, they make decisions on the data that they have. But there is no Google equivalent at these organizations for making decisions. This problem was unsolved, and this problem needed to be solved. So I put very naively in my statement of purpose that I believe that the most important SCI investment for the next decade would be in the management of vast amounts of data. Through my research, I want to make it easier for people to organize, manage, and make sense of data. At that time, I did not know how hard this problem is. Um, Kelly had done his PhD at MIT, so he suggested me, why don't I apply to MIT? So I did apply to MIT. Um, I got in, and I got to this place called MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, known for its really good architecture buildings. Um, so I went there and started a project called Data Hub Project with the key goal of how you can make data accessible to every single person. So the goal of Data Hub was to give every single organization in the world a tool so that they can organize and manage their data that makes it accessible to every single individual within that organization. We spent about three years working on this, and MIT has a really good industry partner program. So they basically have a bunch of sort of uh, you know, companies that are part of their research. So a lot of people started using this. So a lot of people basically started experimenting. They loved this project. And their question was how we can use this in production, how we can actually use this for real. And one of the things that you learn by being in academia is the focus is on research, focus is on understanding, focus is on writing papers. So I, I was at the crossroad, like, should I continue to be in academia or should I go and start a company? And there was just the commencement address that Larry had given in 2009 at the University of Michigan, which had the sentence which sort of like pushed me towards dropping out. And the sentence was, it is actually a great time in your life to get a little, get a little crazy, follow your curiosity, and be ambitious about it. So I dropped out and moved to this place called Silicon Valley. Uh, once I moved there, the first thing you do, and as a business school, you all know, which is go and raise money from investors, because then you can hire more people, you can do things. So I went and talked to a number of investors, and Ian Greylock, there are some cool stories, but the most important part was, I had no customers, I had no built product apart from basic research idea, but what sort of like, you know, pushed them towards investing in us was how ambitious this project was, what would be the impact if we are really able to solve this? And I literally had only three meetings, first two investors decided to invest in us. So we raised money, and I was like, now I have everything to start a company and solve this problem. But then you realize you have to get a visa if you drop out from a school in the US, because you cannot work on that visa. You have to get a different visa. Uh, and that got rejected. And the reason why it got rejected is because in order to get work visa, you have to be an employee of the company. So you can't start your own company and call yourself an employee, <coughs> because otherwise you can keep getting you know, free visas. So, now I cannot work there. So MIT, I have a huge regard for that as an institution. They admitted me back. So I went back to MIT, appealed against this decision. It took about 14 to 18 months to actually get that decision reversed. So in 2016, I finally got the decision reversed, got my visa approved, and then started working on this problem. So the problem that I got pulled towards, so we said, like, this idea sounds great, you know, you want to sort of make it easy for anyone to access any information. Can you solve this problem? I, I am a bank and I want to make a decision about whether somebody should get, get a loan or not and they submit a bunch of these stuff. And can you help me make that decision in less than five seconds? I didn't realize how hard this problem would be. Uh, and this problem turned out to be really, really hard. So the, all the techniques that were there at that given point in time, the way people would approach this problem is like, can I look at the document? where the word or the things that I, I care about exist, go like 30 pixels below, 10 pixels on the right, and can extract things. That works if every document looks exactly the same, right? But that's not really true in the real world. Or you can write rules, like if you want to extract like statement date, look for the word date, see if there is date around it. That did not work because 
you cannot trust the structure of that argument. The classical machine learning, where you can train some models, produce very, very bad results. There was some research going on, and I spent a lot of time researching on this. It's called program synthesis, which is can you build a domain-specific language that can understand sort of vocabulary in a particular domain and can help you answer that question. That also worked, but kind of like only solved a narrow problem. So this problem turned out to be much, much harder than I imagined. So we decided to double down on this, because you want to solve hard problems. Uh, so Andreessen Horowitz, one of the prominent VC firm in the Valley, they backed us because they believe that this is an important problem for the whole world to be solved. And as I think they write in, it, in their investment note, which is, we are going after a holy grail in automation problem. Understanding and providing a framework for automating the processing of unstructured and offline data which to date had been only done by humans is an important problem. Until now, a general method of doing so from an automation perspective has largely been done only in the realms of research or science fiction. So we decided to go and double down on this problem. Um, one of the values that Instabase had, which also was you know, shamelessly copied from Larry Page's commencement address at Michigan, is a healthy disregard for the impossible. The reason you can make progress or the world can make progress, is when you pick going after problems that nobody else wants to touch. Because if everybody chooses not to touch those problems, you can never make progress. So we decided to go after that problem. Um, at the same time, though, there were other progresses being made in the industry. So we are not the only one working on doing cool stuff. A lot of people like us are also working on solving some of these problems. So there's this landmark paper that came, which is currently the foundation of all of the AI advancement that you are seeing is called Transformer Paper with the title Attention is All You Need. That came from Google Research. What this paper really did was it basically gave a framework for understanding language in a way that allowed you to understand it at a, at a conceptual level and can answer questions. And the first pre-trained model was released in 2018 by Google called BERT. This is a, one of the first large pre-trained transformer-based language model and notable for its dramatic improvement over any previous state-of-the-art models. So this was very promising. So we wanted to double down on that. We tested it. It did not produce good results. And the reason why it did not produce good results was because these language assumed language as sequence of text, which is true for the most part. But if you look at documents, like invoices, it's not sequence of text. It's a layout. It's basically geometry. Like you have to look at the boxes. You have to look at the tables. You have to like understand in two-dimensional space where they fit. So the sequence of text representational model did not work well. And we might never be able to fully solve this problem unless we solve the central AI problem. However, there are promising research that is happening around us, and we should go and double down on this. So this was a note sent in 2019, um, which was sent to the team. Because whenever some of these things happen, your question is, should I do it, should I not do it? So we decided to be decisive. And this, this note basically tells you that we made it very clear to the company that we are at a point where we, engineering products, solutions team don't need to spend time discussing and debating the feasibility of deep learning techniques anymore. We have determined that this will be the future, and we will heavily invest in that. Uh, we are going to make this default approach, and only if this does not work, we will look for alternatives. And we put significant amount of investment in this area. This paid off. At the end of 2021, we built one of the very first pre-trained layout aware language models. So BERT had built the language model which represented sequence of text as language, we basically represented language model that also took X and Y coordinate in geometry that allowed you to understand documents. And this produced a result on parallel level in the history. So now we have the ability to understand language at scale. The problems that I was talking about being unsolvable in 2019 were now within the reach of AI. At the same time, there was a lot of parallel advancement that was happening. OpenAI had started working on generative pre-trained transformer called GPT. GPT-1 and 2 were still sequence to sequence models, but then they added bidirectionality to it, and GPT-3 was mind-blown. GPT-3 models had the real ability to understand text. And then in 2022, this product got released by OpenAI called ChatGPT, which for the first time gave a glimpse to the world that now for the first time we can say AI had the ability to understand complex language and be able to answer questions on that. What this really means. Now we were able to extend this because OpenAI was trained on the data on the internet, can we do that for the data that sits inside the organization firewall? Like, can I take 10K report from Apple and can ask the question, like, what is Apple's net sale in Japan in 2016? How much more money iPhone division made in 2015? Or 
compare I, iPhone versus iPad. Because these are the questions that are important for decision making. Otherwise, you have to read this like 80 page report. If you have a portfolio of 1,000 customers, that's a lot of time. Like, we should be able to answer these questions in a fraction of a second. So we made progress, and this was something that fundamentally changed our interaction with the customers. Customers also started believing that now these problems are within the reach. We launched this product AI Hub, which was last year, which sort of like converted this into three key aspects that enterprise needed. One is convert, where you can ask questions on your data. Second is build, because a lot of organizations build applications that does this on the behalf of you know, the workflow that they run. And third one is a lot of applications are similar. So you basically have a pre-built applications. Uh, now we are in 2024. And I think as we enter in 2024, the enabling technology has come a long way. And we can finally focus on the core goal of the mission, which is can we help every single organization turn their data into insights instantly? The data that is inside their firewall. The data that they make decision from every single day. The decisions that impact our day-to-day -day lives. Government, healthcare, insurance, everywhere. And looking at the AI advancement that has happened in the last couple of years, and it continues to happen, I think it's much more within reach than it has ever been before. And what this really means is, if this mission is fulfilled, this will have an impact similar to what Google has had. It will fundamentally change the human progress as a whole. And the reason why is because it will make every single organization in the world much more productive. It will help every single organization in the world make better decisions. And these decisions that we live as part of our day-to-day -day life, they fundamentally change the human progress that affects every single individual. So in the end, if I have to leave a note, you're going to have your share of bad ideas. You would not get everything right. You should allow for the possibilities that you will make mistakes along the way. For me, what has really worked is to engage with the world. And don't engage with the world as if we know everything, not as a high-minded voyager, but more as a curious explorer, more as adventurer, where I could take crack at the problems that I consider is worth pursuing. So I hope this was helpful, and hope many of you will go on to build something enduring, something that will make the world a better place. Thank you.